Good afternoon. And uh, the panel took of it uh, a digitalization boost and supervisor response uh, uh, with Frank Elderson. We'll start now. Frank, do we have Frank delved in? Thank you so much, Maichi. Am I being heard? Now we very can good. hear you, Frank, very well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much also to the organizer, and I think good to see you, um, all your brain as well here on the screen. Um, as the um, COVID-19 pandemic uh, unfolded back in March of this year, suddenly hundreds of thousands of financial sector workers uh, were working from home, as I am uh, today myself. Uh, from board members to secretaries, our homes became our new offices and Skype became our new uh, meeting room. And that was a major shock, but we all adapted quickly. IT systems that once took uh, maybe ages to implement were rolled out in a matter of weeks. And um, network capacity was stepped up in record time. Also, the trend from cash to digital payments accelerated. And to just give you an example, just before the lockdown in mid-March, the Dutch used um, three out of 10 retail payments, they used cash. And now they use it for only two out of 10 retail payments. So that is a huge drop in the cash usage um, in only a few months time. In addition, we have seen a large increase in online payments. And what happened back in March uh, could perhaps most be uh, best be compared with a, if you allow me this metaphor, with a with a swimming pool. A year ago, we we might all have been merely dipping our toes in the water, but the COVID nineteen kind of like pushed us in, and now we are swimming. Um, and what is very clear now is that COVID nineteen has accelerated digitalization. And, and many of these developments are, are welcome. Uh, first and foremost, uh, thanks to our digitalization jump, uh, the financial system largely continued to function as normal. Uh, as the world economy went into lockdown, the financial system remained open. And that, in and on itself, is a remarkable feat. One that bears witness to the operational resilience um, of the financial sector and to the power and opportunities that digitalization has brought us. Another upside is that customers are getting used to doing things digitally. And this opens up opportunities for banks to introduce new products and to reduce costs. Now, of course, there's also a risk side to this all. And I wouldn't be a supervisor without wanting to stress that as well. There is a risk side. It is notable, um, but on that side, uh, first of all, it is notable that there were no major operational incidents during the pandemic. But at the same time, we know that operational and especially cyber risks have clearly increased. Since COVID-19, we have seen a spike in cyber threats like ransomware attacks and phishing. And both the risk and possible impact of operational incidents caused by people, failed processes and systems have increased as a result um, of greater reliance on virtual working arrangements. For example, we have seen that several third party providers suffered ransomware attacks that could have severely affected the financial system. The big question financial institutions and supervisors need to keep asking themselves, especially in the current environment, is are our operational resilience um, processes keeping up with the faster pace of digital developments? When it comes to fintech, I think COVID-19 has also accelerated existing trends. The future development of fintech is a function of technological innovation on the one hand and changing consumer preferences on the other. And it might have been that COVID-19 did not immediately bring new technology, 
but it may have moved consumer preferences more towards digital. People kept contact with each other uh, via Zoom, FaceTime, Skype, school children all over the world, followed online lessons, uh, and online retail, we all have noticed, went through the roof. From there, it may be only a small step for these consumers now having been getting used even, even more to digitalization, um, to paying, for example, with WhatsApp or getting mortgage uh, loans from, from quick on loans. So COVID-19 may have influenced digitalization in many different ways. And if there's anything the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us here, is that the adoption of new technology is non-linear. There might be tipping points. Um, and normally we speak about tipping points in other contexts, maybe in the climate context, but also here there might be tipping points and you might be looking at tipping points at points of no return. Um, when technology is already available, sometimes it takes only one event to cause a sudden and decisive shift in consumer preferences. And this adds all the more urgency to the big questions that were already at the table before the pandemic. And I will, I think I have, I, I have here um, uh, categorized, categorized for you about 10, 10 of these big questions that I think are important. Um, how will fintech impact the business model of traditional banks? What role will big tech firms play? Um, when the lines between banks and technology firms become more and more blurred, who is responsible for security and financial stability? Do we understand the algorithms that are being applied increasingly in banking? How do new technologies influence cyber and financial crime? Are we as supervisors sufficiently equipped in terms of knowledge um, and staff to keep up with these ever increasing faster and faster developments? What are the holes, the possible holes and obstacles in regulation. What does it mean for the level, level playing field when regulated and unregulated entities compete in the same markets? And how can supervisors themselves use these new technologies to improve supervisory practices? And last but not least, maybe it's something that is not being mentioned too much in this, this, in this field, but I think it is a very important one. There are social issues involved in digitalization as well. Not everyone can keep pace with the current, uh, the current speed of digitalization. Digital exclusion of vulnerable groups of consumers, like the elderly or people on a low income, is a serious issue today. Now, this is only a subset of a vast area, if you like, of questions that are relevant to the stability of the financial system. But I must say, I have total confidence uh, in the panel uh, today uh, to be able to answer many, if not all, of these questions. And this brings me to the last issue that I would like to raise. And that is, how should supervisors uh, respond to these changes? There, there used to be a time uh, when financial supervision might have been viewed basically as being reactive. The idea was that by nature, uh, supervisors are always at least one step behind, behind the market, and um, that we should, of course, um, aim to keep that inevitable gap as narrow as possible. But I think that supervisors that still adhere to that view are missing the demands of the new times. If ever in the current landscape, uh, with fast but fundamentally uncertain changes, Supervisors should be forward-looking and adaptive. And by forward-looking, I do not mean that supervisors uh, as, as ourselves can predict the future. We, we can't. Um, and even if we tried, we'd probably be worse at it than the industry. But we should say we should stay on top of developments. Um, thinking in terms of scenarios and broaden the dialogue, such as today, um, uh, from the financial sector um, 
to also uh, include important tech and infrastructure players. And I think that this is also a good approach when it comes to the development of new regulation. Uh, notably, the European Commission proposals on the regulation of the use of cloud services uh, by financial sector and its digital strategy. And when I say that supervisors should be adaptive, uh, what I mean is to acknowledge the fact that existing regulation was often drafted with a different world in mind. And that this regulation it cannot always be literally applied to the new digital world. Adaptive then means to act from a set of core principles, to apply them in a way that fits the new environment and leaves space for innovation. While, of course, continuing to protect customers and financial stability. And to give you an example, two, two months ago, um, we at the Dutch Central Bank, uh, published a discussion paper called the general principles for the use of artificial intelligence in the financial sector and to sum it up uh, in one sentence a firm should pay due attention to the soundness accountability fairness ethics skills and transparency aspects of the applications that they develop and we are using this discussion paper and the comments received to engage in a dialogue with the Dutch financial sector about the use of artificial intelligence. Finally, new technology also creates opportunities for supervisors to improve their own effectiveness. In 2018, the Dutch Central Bank has set up a dedicated supervision innovation department to coordinate and accelerate the implementation of our digital strategy. And the strategy's purpose is to adopt a more data-driven and uh, deploy technology to support, a more data-driven approach, I should say, and to deploy a technology to support the supervisory process. And the ultimate goal being to transform DMB in what we call a smart uh, supervisor. Also, when it comes to supervision, uh, COVID-19 has increased the awareness of the potential of digital utilization. Digital processes are, for example, not susceptible to the impact of reduced staff availability during a lockdown such as we have seen um, this spring. It also increased the broad mindset that digitalization is the new normal and boosted acceptance of working with new digital tools throughout the entire workforce. So to sum up, COVID-19 has stepped up the pace of digital developments. And this has given more urgency to the policy questions that were already at the table. It requires supervisors to be forward-looking and adaptive and to keep up with developments to improve their own supervisory practice. I will stop here and I will look um, and I look forward um, to discussing these issues uh, more in depth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank, for your keynote. And uh, I can tell you that uh, the digitalization gives also insight in the private whereabouts of our panelists. And there are some comments here about the picture in your background. So that side effect also of the digital uh, conferences like that. Uh, I would like to move to introduce the two further panelists on the panel today. Uh, Marcus Günther, CEO of the number 26 bank, and Dr. Oli Ren, uh, with us from Helsinki, governor of the Bank of Finland. Uh, welcome, Marcus. Welcome, Oli. And I would like to jump on the swimming pool analogy from Frank. So we were pushed into the swimming pool and we had to start to learn swimming really quickly. So if you look at the last six, nine months, what has been changing most as far, as far as the digitalization is concerned. So, Marcus, let's start with you. So, what you have observed in the last six, nine months, the biggest changes for your organization? First of all, let me say thank you for having us. Uh, um, we're obviously proud and, uh, um, and, and happy to be joining here as representative of a fintech turned bank or a fintech bank, if you want, as I like to call it. So, um, coming back to your question, also the, the picture uh, Frank used. 
I think obviously we are a company that uh, is not so much tiptoeing into the water, but really being born in the water, if you want, or uh, having having uh, a very genetic uh, uh, um, like uh, relationship to to digitalization, to digitization. So. Um, as a company, I think we can be proud of, as, as also other companies, that basically within days we were able to totally turn around the way we worked um, and move people into flexible working situations, into home office, um, without losing any track uh, on the market, without um, having any problems on an operational basis. I think this is remarkable and it obviously also has a lot to do with digitization. Um, and also with BCM programs, um, um, business continuity is very important in this area and in these times, um, and, and that worked really, really well. So from an internal point of view, I think um, uh, digitization and also the business model has proven very, very stable and, and resilient. Um, if you look at, at, at consumers, um, because you asked about change, what, what really changed, I also would, would point out that um, consumers are basically moving with a lot more pace into the direction where we are happy to see them move, uh, which means they obviously need a lot less uh, branch uh, uh, relationships, so they, they don't need bank branches anymore. Uh, we have seen that um, serving customers in a proper way, bank customers in a proper way, is possible without uh, bank branches. That is one, I think, um, a very, very interesting um, a thing that we saw also proven now in a very critical situation. Second, um, we see um, clients, not only our clients, but, but obviously mostly our clients also moving away from, from uh, cash, which is um, very, very good for our business model, which is very interesting for our business model. We have seen in some uh, countries drop ATM usage uh, around 70%. Very strong uh, uh, differences uh, and movements. We see countries like Germany catching up in in the use of digital money, in um, uh, staying away from from cash, um, in using e-commerce a lot more. Uh, we have seen, uh, for example, around 20 to 30 percent more um, volumes in e-commerce, um, which is also obviously very interesting for our business model. And we see people um, over over 50, like I am. We see them use um, even more uh, e-commerce in a, in, a, in, a, in a very more intensive way, much more intensive way, 30% more volumes in this, in, in this target group. So a lot of changes and, and, and I think um, digitization basically is definitely one of the few positive aspects that, that, um, that are in a, in a parallel movement with, uh, with the COVID crisis. Uh, just a look at the European Digital Economy Associated Index 2020, so we have a digital native bank, but uh, indeed uh, both uh, the Netherlands but also Finland are the digital leaders within the European Union. So question to, to Oli, how have you seen the changes uh, after this being pushed or maybe being naturally born in this swimming pool that Frank mentioned? Thank you. Thank you much. It's uh, good afternoon to every, everybody and uh, many thanks to Frank for his uh, very insightful keynote uh, and also to Marcus for his, uh, his very interesting uh, insights. Uh, as to the uh, swimming pool analogy, uh, which I just heard, uh, I think uh, we could say that uh, in uh, macro terms, uh, as uh, the European economy or Eurozone, we are still uh, our head above the water, even though we face uh, quite uh, significant uh, challenges, as we all know, in terms of uh, employment and, uh, and growth. And uh, we are moving fast uh, and uh, swimming freestyle in the field of, uh, in the water of uh, digitalization, which indeed uh, has been, uh, has been uh, one of the upsides uh, of this uh, otherwise uh, uh, downside uh, event of uh, all the crisis. Uh, and uh, in this regard, uh, uh, I fully agree that uh, COVID-19 uh, has accelerated uh, digitalization and uh, that uh, while COVID uh, itself is not uh, welcome, of course, uh, at the same time, uh, most of these uh, developments uh, in uh, the acceleration of digitalization are uh, very welcome. We have witnessed uh, the biggest immediate uh, 
changes uh, in uh, a large scale adoption of uh, new and uh, existing technologies, uh, um, which have enabled us new ways of working, both uh, remote and uh, hybrid, uh, which is uh, increasingly becoming a new normal, which will likely have uh, a lasting impact uh, in our work and in our, our society. In the financial sector, digitalization has been a prevailing trend uh, actually for quite some time already. Although with differences in the speed of uh, transformation across uh, countries. Uh, as uh, Frank noted in his uh, keynote, uh, the digitalization jump uh, or this uh, great leap forward uh, was crucial in helping uh, keep the financial system open when the global economy went into the great uh, lockdown. And in this connection, I think it's important to underline that uh, the underline the paramount importance of uh, the major regulatory and supervisory reforms uh, of the past uh, decade uh, in ensuring that uh, European banks uh, have been part of the solution instead of the problem in the current uh, crisis. The ECB has uh, conducted uh, over the summer, in the last couple of uh, months and weeks, uh, has conducted uh, a vulnerability analysis uh, which uh, seems to indicate that uh, the euro area banking sector is uh, overall uh, relatively solid uh, and resilient uh, in the baseline scenario. And the same goes for the, for instance, for the Finnish banking se sector. We learned our lessons uh, in the 1990s uh, and uh, the Finnish banking sector is relatively resilient and uh, now moving quite fast uh, in terms of uh, digitalization. However, in the stressed scenario, the Problems like uh, non-performing loans uh, and uh, increased uh, expected losses uh, in the enterprise sector, in the corporate sector, uh, would cause uh, more serious uh, damage uh, to the capital buffers and uh, operations of uh, banks. Uh, so, uh, while I said uh, we have uh, our head above the water for the moment, uh, yes, that is true, but at the same time, uh, we have to stay very vigilant uh, both as regards uh, monetary policy and as regards uh, uh, regulatory action and uh, other activities in the field of uh, economic uh, uh, policy. I might add still a second point, uh, which I think is quite important, and that's uh, the future concerning payments. Uh, the revised uh, payment services directive, PSD2, has, two has been uh, an important uh, regulatory development uh, that improved uh, payment uh, legislation to be better suited for a digital economy. And now we are currently discussing uh, the European retail payments uh, strategy, which contains uh, valuable elements uh, that are needed to maintain uh, European uh, retail payment market uh, competitive and uh, innovative. In developing this uh, strategy, we need to have a a comprehensive, uh, holistic approach uh, and understand how the business case uh, and business plans uh, can be made uh, viable for, for all relevant uh, actors. So I'm very much looking forward to cooperation between the private sector and uh, central banks uh, in this field. And this also means that uh, we must also take in, into account uh, developments uh, in uh, central bank uh, digital currencies or CBDCs uh, while the issuance of uh, a digital euro is uh, not foreseen uh, in the immediate future, the euro system has a uh, clear and keen interest uh, in line with its mandate uh, to tackle the challenges uh, that arise uh, from the digitalization of uh, payments. And this exercise uh, certainly includes uh, exploring the role of uh, central bank uh, in the provision of uh, retail payment uh, services. I might uh, conclude by saying that uh, a CBDC should be seen in a wider context uh, complementing private sector initiatives uh, and uh, supporting uh, a comprehensive uh, retail payment strategy in Europe. Uh, 
any introduction of uh, a digital euro would not be without uh, its uh, challenges. Uh, a digital euro would, uh, first of all, have to meet uh, the needs of the general public, uh, of our citizens, uh, and secondly, it should avoid uh, the pitfalls uh, in terms of uh, financial stability. So, to conclude, uh, work will continue to analyze these issues uh, within the uh, euro system, and uh, we want to work together with the private sector and uh, banks in Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Oli. And uh, let's uh, move. Uh, you already started to, to have a look at the future in terms of payments. Uh, let's have further look into the crystal ball uh, future outlook, as we did in the in the previous panel. So, Frank, I think uh, over to you. You mentioned uh, a smart supervisor. So, can you elaborate a bit more? Where is the future role for technology at the DNB? So, how do you see? The, the use of technology, do you see greater need for collaboration, as, as Oli also referred, in terms of payments between the market and the supervisors? And, and, and how do you foresee the smart supervisor and data-driven supervisor, as I think one of the press releases from the DNB recently mentioned, uh, moving uh, in the next six to 18 months? Well, well thank you. Thank you so very much. And thank you also, uh, Oli Rain, for your uh, very thoughtful remarks. Um, um, Maybe before diving into answering your direct question, um, um, things are moving very fast. What we are seeing is an unbundling of services that, that originally was, was, were, were being delivered by banks, uh, but deposit taking, payments, as Ori Wayne already mentioned, um, loans are being unbundled. Um, fintechs are specializing sometimes in one or two of these aspects, not all of them. They have not. Um, they are not hampered by legacy systems, as many of the banks are. Um, are producing products that are more um, customer friendly. The customers, as we have just learned um, from the various other speakers, that um, have gotten a boost, if you like, in terms of their own ability and mindset in terms of digitalization. Um, so banks really have a um, a very serious task to do in terms of making sure that they keep abreast of all these developments. And I, um, I saw a speech by um, uh, your fellow uh, countryman, uh, Oli um, uh, Pinti Hagarainen, uh, on, on this issue um, some time ago, in which he mentioned that, yes, there is about, I think it was about 25% of the banks um, in the euro area that have now actually increased um, their spending uh, and their planning in terms of digitalization. Um, but there is also about a 25% of those who, in terms of cost cutting, have been forced, if you like, to, um, to decrease uh, and, uh, and to scale down their plans in digitalization. And that, I think, is something that is worrisome because if in the end um, there is a the bank will have to fight for their position in this new, new area, especially those who uh, were not born, if you like, in water, uh, to stick with that, uh, with that metaphor. Now, why do I say these things um, as an introduction to answering your question? I think to a certain extent this is also, also true for supervisors. Uh, we also have legacy uh, systems. Um, we also have people with mindsets that need to uh, be brought squarely uh, into 2020 and 2020 and uh, beyond. Um, we must make sure that we don't only um, in understand all the developments that are out there, but that we also can interact with them in a way that uh, keeps um, keeps uh, keeps pace uh, with these developments. So to make that a little bit more uh, concrete, uh, we have um, a, a strategy in which we look at all the developments outside. And we try to understand them. Uh, we look inside um, in terms of training our own people, in terms of investing uh, in our IT um, possibilities, in investing in artificial intelligence. We are increasingly using uh, using these uh, these tools. Uh, but there's much more to be done. And we are also investing actually together in what we call an I-Forum, uh, toge together with the, uh, the, the, the financial sector in, um, um, in selecting um, uh, those projects that, um, that we mutually feel can help uh, um, each other. So it's not just us behind closed doors in an ivory tower thinking about our own strategy in terms of digitalization. It is in close contact with the banks. For example, also investing, uh, and when I say banks, I, I mean actually broader because we are an integrated supervisor. 
um, in order to also make it more uh, more easy um, for, uh, for for example for data provision to us uh, so that there might also be a positive business case in the end uh, for the financial sector um, as they, um, uh, they, they 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 have to uh, contribute to, to to our costs as well so there is a there, there might be a, a mutual benefit but I think the the main message that I would like to give, um, if you like, to the banks, and that is that um, you know things are unfolding so fast. Um, people are going to be used to very consumer-friendly and very efficient uh, and very easy to use uh, services that are being uh, granted um, uh, more and more uh, by the fintechs, and people will not opt for less than uh, that quality. So if you are a bank and you cannot uh, cannot keep up with that pace, in the end, you will be uh, in trouble. And um, now, of course, as a supervisor, if you like, we have some kind of monopoly power, but we will not be able to be effective and efficient supervisors if we do not make these investments ourselves as well. Thank you very much. And uh, I think there is a digital supervisors to be born that can swim in digital waters. So let's, let, let's see for that. And uh, Marcus, you mentioned N26 born in digital waters. How do you see the trends? Will they intensify? Will they fundamentally change something? How this will uh, impact the established banks versus fintech like yourselves interplay in the market? Well, I definitely think that um, as we have a situation that takes quite a long time and that will take more time uh, if we talk about the COVID input on or uh, impact on, on digitization and, and, and changes in the market. So I think, yes, there were trends, there are trends, but they are more and more turning into fu fundamental changes very quickly, uh, driven by uh, a lot of impact, but also by, by COVID-19. Uh, if you compare a, a, a traditional bank and we have... Um, like um, heard about cost from Felix Hufeld, but also from, from, from other uh, um, uh, colleagues here. Um, this is obviously a very, very important aspect. While we usually, as, as, um, as a fintech company or as a fintech born company, think a lot about customer centricity and how we optimize the front end to the customer, and probably also to a certain extent revolutionize it, I think uh, a second aspect of, uh, aspect of digitization will be, will be obviously cost management and we will um, need uh, really efficient structures also internally in the banks, not only uh, in, in the customer facing, uh, to really, um, to really have, a, have a competitive advantage. And I see uh, here a big field, a very important field for fintechs to, to, to break new ground uh, in many ways. Um, Basically, what established banks have is, is, is legacy, um, but also in customers, which is a positive thing, because they have a lot of customers, um, and they have a lot of products and things already built. Whereas on the, on the fintech side, obviously our a big advantage is uh, we are born in, in, in the new technology, we are using the new technology, we are very much customer-centric, uh, we have a cost advantage from the very beginning in many ways. Um, the mindset of the people doesn't need to be changed. Uh, we heard Frank uh, talk about it. That's, that's a huge, uh, a, a huge uh, effort uh, to be done in an established organization um, and many things more. And, um, and so I think um, definitely there's a, there's a high resilience uh, of, of these uh, digital models and they are made for these modern times, I think. Thank you. Maybe only a short question to you because Frank was in his list of questions was a bit having concerns about financial inclusion. So if we will not leave some people behind, I think, Marcus, you alluded that you actually see the shift, which is a bit of the countering that uh, what, what, what Frank was, was a bit concerned about. Oli, what's your view on the uh, social dimension, let's say, of digitalization and how you can see it from the Finnish perspective? I think it's... Uh an essential element of uh, our work as uh, policymakers uh, and uh, regulators. Uh, we need to make uh, sure, we, we, we want and uh, we need to make uh, sure that uh, society remains uh, inclusive. And that concerns also the financial sector, financial activities, uh, financial literacy. And uh, this calls for us uh, looking at, uh, this requires that we look at uh, the digital transformation from the citizen's uh, standpoint. Uh, and uh, in addition to promoting uh, the digital capabilities, uh, we ensure that uh, they have uh, 
we try to ensure that uh, they have a sufficient uh, required uh, financial literacy as well. This may become uh, even more challenging with the fragmentation and uh, proliferation of uh, financial services and in general in the digital world because uh, you don't have the you don't anymore have the physical uh, budgetary constraint uh, of uh, having banknotes uh, in your wallet uh, or not uh, your wallet is uh, mobile in increasingly mobile or digital in other form and uh, that requires uh, new forms of uh, digital uh, literacy i think uh, even more generally uh, in uh, designing appropriate public policy we should ident identify uh, what is real and what is hype uh, what I mean is that uh, basically we can, uh, broadly speaking, divide uh, the digital transformation in finance in uh, three categories. Uh, first, uh, those that uh, clearly enhance uh, economic and social welfare, like uh, mobile and uh, real-time payments. Uh, second, uh, those that uh, whose contribution in social welfare is uh, actually questionable or outright uh, negative, like uh, booms and busts, uh, related to crypto, crypto assets uh, and uh, third finally those that carry a promise to increase uh, economic and social welfare but uh, should be further developed uh, such as uh, say instruments and uh, technologies based on uh, machine learning and uh, artificial uh, intelligence this is how i would uh, see this and uh, this is also how we can uh, future proof our legislation and uh, supervisory uh, activities. Thank you very much, Oli. And as we are already entering in the digital break, so very short one-sentence question to all three of you. Christmas wish for digital 2021. So not this Christmas, let's go a bit farther. Digitalization needs a bit time. Markus, let's start with you. Single, short Christmas wish. My Christmas wish is definitely that, that our employees can return back to the office as soon as possible because innovation, also if it's digitization, is best done uh, together and, and in cooperation. And even if we manage it properly, uh, to do that outside of the classical office situation, it works better in the office. And the second uh, thought would be towards the regulator, I think. Uh, there's a lot of work still to be done in terms of uh, European unification. We've talked about that also in the very beginning of the conference. And um, if you think about KYC, if you think about customer protection, if you think about IBAN discrimination and many, many things more that make it very hard to have trans-European or uh, intra-European business models, I think uh, we need a step forward here. Thank you, Markus. Oli, your Christmas wish for digitalization 2021? I like uh, Frank's picture so much that uh, I want to make an analogy to that. Uh, I guess uh, uh, his uh, painting is uh, describing uh, a supervisory landscape. Uh, it's a very postmodern landscape. Uh, mine uh, behind uh, behind my, my head is uh, more moderate uh, modernism from the 1960s. Uh, that's okay for a macro guy. And you can call it uh, the shape of recovery, which is uh, kind of a crippled, uh, truncated uh, square root. Uh, my Christmas piece is that uh, we can continue on the path of uh, economic recovery and uh, that uh, digital, digital transformation is uh, indeed uh, a central element, a central part of uh, that uh, recovery, where also the European funding and resources uh, will be used. Thank As you a very final remark, yeah. I'd like to welcome you all to Helsinki for the next uh, SSM roundtable in the spring. And although we have uh, become uh, pretty fluent with uh, the digital seminar technology by now, I hope that uh, we can hold our next discussions uh, in person and uh, uh, face to face. So, welcome and bienvenue. Welcome, welcome to Helsinki. Hopefully next spring. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oli. And last but not least, uh, Frank, your short digital wish. Well, thank you so much. I think it is very difficult in these, if you like, still very awful times, talking about a Christmas wish and not just saying that I just hope that, you know, everyone um, will be safe uh, and, um, and that we will come out of this um, uh, as soon as possible. I think that is a deep felt wish that all of us have. Um, beyond that, since this is about digitalization, um, I hope 
that we will be talking also about digitalization in, uh, in Helsinki, but we will actually be meeting together uh, because uh, we have learned from this COVID crisis that yes, we can do lots and lots of things over the screen, but there's nothing but um, um, being together as real human beings. That is something uh, that, that we all miss. Um, beyond that, I hope uh, in the digital sphere that we will be able to build on the positive uh, lessons that we have drawn uh, during this last uh, last half year. It will be a precipitation of developments that were going to happen anyway. I think many of these developments are uh, very much to be welcomed, both for consumers, uh, but also for banks in terms of cost cutting and uh, possibilities to serve uh, consumers. Um, but I wouldn't be a supervisor if, uh, except for these wishes, I would also um, um, uh, conclude on some kind of concern. And the concern is that um, banks must, uh, must develop um, um, strategies and cannot scale back on those in terms of digitalization. This will not go away uh, and they will, be, um, they, they will need to incorporate this um, in the very DNA of their thinking, as some already have since they were born and others will have to master as soon as possible. Thank, thank you, you very much, that. Frank. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Oli. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Frank. And uh, we will have a break now. Uh, we will uh, continue at uh, 3.50. So I would uh, like to welcome the audience in around 12 minutes from now. Thank you very much. <laughs>